I think it's such a great birthday. It's a great birthday cake. I just wish I had someone to celebrate with. Happy birthday, nerd. Nice. <laughs> you were diagnosed with cerebral palsy at nine months old. I don't want to go on the big story because I'm sure you've done this interview many times. Um, it was physical therapy for you. Um, what was gaming then for you at the time? Was that an escape for you? Was that something you went towards just for fun? Like what brought you to gaming as a child? So gaming for me from the very, very start, mm -hmm. it was all about competition. Mm -hmm. So when I was very little, going through school and everything, I couldn't do any of the school sports. I, mm -hmm. I couldn't do athletics. I'd take sick days and everything because I couldn't run, couldn't jump. I remember going to and from classrooms. Kid, kids would push me down the stairs. It was just absolutely mm -hmm. horrendous. And there was no way that I felt that I could really compare to any of the kids in any kind of activity or mm -hmm. sport or what have you. I did okay academically, but there was nothing athletic in a sense. Mm -hmm. But I had a Nintendo 64 back home with yeah. Mario Kart and yeah. I could race my, like my siblings uh -huh. and race mum and dad and everything yeah. and I just grinded away at that because it was the one thing that I could kind of compete with the other kids in. Mm, it was did like, you feel like a level playing field kind of? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. it felt like a level playing field for a while until yeah. like they'd go to bed because they've had enough and I'd just stay <laughs> up there grinding playing. Mario yeah. Kart time yeah. trials or something because yeah. I just really, really, really wanted to be good at something mm -hmm. because I struggled so much at everything else. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, no one at home wants to race me yeah. in Mario Kart anymore because I'm just like wiping the floor with <laughs> yeah. yeah. So then what was it that brought you the most joy growing up? Was it... Were you leaning towards more gaming or more swimming? So, swimming didn't bring me any joy growing yeah? up at okay. all. I actually absolutely hated it. I couldn't really? stand it at all. It was something that I knew I had to do and I was also uh, kind of forced to do as a okay. form of physiotherapy. The, right. the thing that made me fall in love with swimming was the realisation of the Paralympics as being a competitive opportunity for me. Right, because okay. Because okay. despite having a disability, it's not the most visible thing in uh -huh. the world. I'm not missing a limb. I don't mm. use a wheelchair to get around. So because of that, I just was always seen as the clumsy kid that couldn't compete or mm. do anything. And mm. I saw myself as that as well. So when I saw the Paralympics as an opportunity for people with milder, less visible, obvious disabilities mm -hmm. to also compete at something and be really good at it, I said, well, I want to do that one day. Yeah. You know, Mum, Dad, please, like, sign me up. Please. So that's when I fell in love with it. But mm -hmm. for a very long time, that was maybe when I was around 10 or 11 years old. Okay. But up until then, the only thing that really brought me any kind of joy and happiness and excitement in life was just gaming, whether mm -hmm. it was, like, you know, playing my siblings in, like, Mario Kart or screwing around in, like, Ocarina of Time mm -hmm. or, like, any of that kind of stuff. Like, that was the thing that I really enjoyed was just something that... I could talk to like possibly some other kids at school about mm. or have a laugh with like my siblings and then yeah it was just like the one thing that made me feel kind of normal mm -hmm. where in the rest of my life I didn't feel normal at mm. all. And then how long was it until you got to a point where you were like okay like I really like gaming like not just like you know playing a console game at home when you were like okay this is starting to feel kind of like more <laughs> than just like casual. So for me the moment when I realized that gaming was something that I really, really enjoyed mm -hmm. was discovering esports. Mm -hmm. So the very first kind of esports exposure and experience that I had was actually Team Fortress 2. Ah, uh, yeah, so of course. So <laughs> way, way back, this might have been maybe 2011, 2012, yeah. playing on a MacBook Pro that I got from school or something. Yeah. So it was absolutely horrid performance in the game. Yeah. And I walked into like a six versus six pub server. Mm -hmm. And this is back in the day before any of those like plugins and support stuff kind of existed. Mm -hmm. So what everyone would do, you'd all join a server and you'd all have to join spectator at the same time. And the last two people to join spec would be like team captains. Mm -hmm. And then they'd have to like have a, a melee battle to pick out, okay, who's gonna like pick first or second, mm -hmm. like, you know, all that kind of stuff. So way, way, way back. And I just really loved it because it was that pure competition. Mm, mm -hmm. It was something that, you know, hey, I play this game a lot because I don't have other social opportunities or things outside of what I'm doing with swimming. But this is something I'm actually really good at. Like, I'm, I'm beating all the other kids that mm. also kind of suck at tier yeah. two because we were all yeah. absolutely horrid at it, like yeah. proper trash. Mm -hmm. But we just came together and played that and had fun. And this mm. was like, hey, I'm really, really enjoying this. 
I never really had any proper competitive experience mm -hmm. in TF2. It was mostly just like community pubs yeah. and everything. But it was a lot of fun. I just really enjoyed that because it's like, hey, something I can compete in where mm -hmm. it doesn't matter that I have a disability because mm -hmm. we all suck at this game. Yeah. <laughs> We're all just trying yeah. to shoot each other. And no like, one can great. see you, right? So like, you can be whoever you want to be when you're gaming. It's not the like assumption of... Yeah, Look exactly. That and that, it's something that's actually... Uh, it struck me as really difficult for quite a long time mm -hmm. where, especially as I started swimming more and more, so I got involved in the early days for my esports career in around 2012, mm -hmm. but I made my first Australian swim team in 2013. Right, okay. So with that, I spent uh, a lot of time still playing TF2 and everything, doing mm -hmm. all my aim prac and these random like community maps and everything. Mm -hmm. And I reached this point where it was like, so the thing that was really, really difficult with, I guess, my identity and my disability within esports and within gaming, uh, starting in esports at the same time as when I started and made my first Australian swim team, mm -hmm. the thing that was really challenging with that was I was so proud of the fact that I finally reached what was and still kind of is the pinnacle of elite mm -hmm. sport. Yeah. I'm representing my country on a global stage. Mm -hmm. And I was so proud of that and I wanted to tell the world about it. So on my Steam profile, I had a list of like my swimming achievements and the fact that mm -hmm. I was on like these national teams and everything. Yeah. And I was also proud yeah. saying, hey, you know, I've done this, I'm on the Paralympic team, I have a disability. Mm -hmm. And the thing that was so challenging with that is the amount of abuse that I actually popped online yeah. from other people. Mm -hmm. And I think in some ways it can be kind of difficult to hold them at fault because they're kids. And when you are young, you don't know what's right and wrong and you're mm -hmm. learning all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it's just a lot of assholes. Oh, absolutely. Straight up. Oh, yeah. In and gaming, especially shooters, it just breeds that. Well, it's the fact crown. that you can hide behind an alias, I think. Absolutely. And it's not just you can, but other people are as well. So when you, mm. when all you're seeing is pixels on a screen and a yeah. name that's floating around, it takes a human element away. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's this kind of thing where you get these kids that say the most horrific, nasty things to each other. Mm -hmm. In person, they would never say any of that, oh, and they never. may be quite lovely. But mm -hmm. online, when you take the person away and there's no repercussions for those kinds of actions, that's when they just think it's okay to let rip. Mm -hmm. And if they don't get punished for saying these kinds of things, like at a, on a school playground, if yeah. they use these really abusive, ableist, sexist, transphobic slurs, mm -hmm. they will get detention, they'll get suspended, they'll get expelled, what have you. Mm -hmm. But in esports, it's just, oh, I'll just queue up again, play the next game, do yeah. it again. And that's that thing that I found really, really difficult for quite a long time. Because although I was so proud of my identity and my disability, mm. I felt like I had to sacrifice my mental health to be mm. proud of that. Mm. Or hide my identity, hide my disability, and then just be like the other kids. And I don't want to do that because I'm, no, I'm yeah. quite proud of... You shouldn't have to hide yeah. it. Yeah, exactly. But then some, like, you should just be able to log into a game and not have to always defend or talk about your identity. Um, this is something just that I experienced as a woman in the space. You know, I'm proud to be a woman. I'm proud to be a woman in gaming. But sometimes I'm like, I wish I could just be like, I wish I didn't have to think about it for like one day. I wish I didn't have to exist as a woman in a space. I wish I could just be a human in the space. Yeah, exactly. Like, I'm proud, but like, come on. It's something <laughs> just give me that a is so. I've done countless tweets about this kind of thing mm. because I'm so passionate about it. I feel mm. like diversity and inclusion is such a misunderstood term. Mm. It literally says in the word inclusion that it's about being included. Yeah. It's not about being put on a pedestal or being lifted above and being like, wow, women can do anything. Women everything. can do anything, yeah. absolutely. But yeah. it's not this thing where it's like, I'm better than you because I'm female. I'm yeah. better than you because I have a disability. It mm -hmm. is, I have a right to access and participate in these kinds of things because I'm a human being yes. and I want to do the things that human beings enjoy. I would just like to exist exactly. in this space yeah. with you. <laughs> yeah. I, I just want to be bad at this video game yeah, with we, you yeah, guys. Please, we, come it on. It has no bearing on like who I am as a person. Yeah, if I'm shit at this, I'm just shit. Yeah, not yeah, because I'm a girl. Like, exactly. God, That's I'm just thing. shit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hi guys, just Loz interrupting real quick, asking you to maybe like this video if you're enjoying it, maybe subscribe to Grieved, it would be really nice. It would mean the world. It would mean a lot. If you could, please. Thank you. Back to the episode, back to Loz. <sighs> I'm so drunk. Can you take us through 
when esports kind of started to become a bit more serious. So you were playing TF2, I know you were playing CSGO a lot, and then obviously you became a pro in Valorant. What was that kind of uh, timeline like, and how did that align with your swimming timeline? So how all of my early esports kind of career, as far as taking more seriously goes, in grade 12 at high school, mm -hmm. um, I was coming off of winning a gold medal at the Commonwealth Games. Mm -hmm. and in grade 12? In grade 11, actually. Oh, so the year Holy before shit. grade 12, what was that I won like? the gold medal. Before you continue, was that? Pretty dang cool, yeah? honestly. Holy shit. Being able to come back to school and everyone's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. go Ron, you're yeah. awesome. And I'm like, uh, yeah, I'm yeah. awesome, but also I did literally none of my schoolwork for the past term and I yeah. just failed at like, four of my five subjects. So, you know, yeah. we'll, we'll take the good with the bad yeah, good anyway. Bad. You know. yeah. um, but I, with the Paralympic swimming system, there's a classification process. Mm -hmm. And it's basically a bunch of tests to determine the severity and level of your disability. Right. And you have to do these tests every couple of years. And from grade 11 to grade 12, I did one of these tests and my category changed. And part of my category oh. changing meant that I went from being rank one in the world and having world records to being rank eight in the world. Like, how bad is that, right? Eight in the world. Like, Can you explain disgraceful. that a so, little more? Like, you don't have to go into it too much, but like, what is it that changed that made you... So basically, they do a bunch of these different tests to determine your, your flexibility, your range of motion, yeah. your power, your coordination. And based on each of these, they give you a point score. Yeah. And based on this point score, uh, from 200 to 220 points is a S9, mm -hmm. and 220 to 230 is S10, or whatever the actual uh, ranges mm -hmm. are. This is done so that you can have the best possible level of fairness between different disability types and Right, categories. of course. Okay. So being someone that has brain damage, has mm -hmm. a neurological disability, a lot of the scores that I get for different parts of my body, generally it's done from zero to five, I'll get a lot of fours or mm -hmm. threes for mm -hmm. being very mild to like moderately mild kind of levels of impairment. Okay. Whereas someone that is an amputee, let's say for one arm, they will have fives everywhere, but they'll get zeros oh. for all of the parts of their arm. Okay. So they do this to try and make it as fair as possible because mm -hmm. you can't really compare apples to oranges. Mm -hmm. It's just to try and make it the fairest that they can do. Mm -hmm. So having cerebral palsy, it is a brain injury mm -hmm. and the brain has capacity for growth and change and parts of the right. brain that are not injured can learn to compensate for parts that are okay so as you grow and as you develop your disability can actually change in some ways which mm -hmm. means that although those parts are absolutely damaged the other parts can learn to compensate better mm -hmm. so the severity right. and extremity okay. of your disability can kind of change in some respects yeah especially when you're talking about something like swimming mm -hmm. where it's movements that you have practiced and rehearsed thousands upon thousands and thousands of times mm -hmm. every single day every week yeah so with this test that i did um i walked in and then i walked out and my category changed okay and right because your brain and your body had changed yeah in exactly. growing up right okay so it was really 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 difficult for me to deal with at the time yeah because although it sounds like it's a pretty nice position to be in to be ranked eighth in the world but when you're rank one it's not just when you're rank one, but it's also to qualify for an Australian team, you have to be top five. Oh, okay. To receive funding and support to be able to swim, oh. you have to be top five. So it's like your rug was pulled. Exactly. Okay. And something I struggled with so much psychologically at this time, I placed all of my self-worth as an athlete mm. on winning gold medals, breaking yeah. records, on being the best. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, I was no longer the best because my categories changed. So mm -hmm. I just thought, oh, this is useless. You know, this absolutely sucks. You mm -hmm. know? I still had to swim and still had to train for my general health and fitness. So I continued that throughout grade 12, but I said, you know, screw this, I'm gonna go do something else competitive with my time. Mm -hmm. So then instead of being addicted to swimming competition, <laughs> yeah. got involved in Counter-Strike. Yeah. One of the other students in one of my grade 12 classes was a CS player, mm -hmm. was nothing super insane. Like he played a couple of CGO tournaments and I think he played one or two in CGA but his team is like bottom of the barrel in the amateur mm -hmm. leagues kind of thing. Yeah. And I said, oh, wow, cyber game or anything. This looks really cool. I'd love to kind of check this out and see what it's about. Mm -hmm. And then trying to just get involved in that space throughout grade 12 and being like, wow, this competitive Counter-Strike thing. Yeah. It's so interesting and such a beautiful game, not just that it's something that I play all the time, mm. but I could see that there's this beautiful like pathway of progression that you can go through as a player. 
And I saw a lot of ways that I could put my time and energy and knowledge from skill development and swimming mm. and translate that over to Counter-Strike mm -hmm. in terms of identifying individual aspects of aim and mechanics and yeah. things that I could focus on in that space to kind of give me an edge over other players that mm. were just addicted to the game and playing it for yeah. 10 hours a day or what have you. Yeah. So I fell in love with that. I ended up going through, mm. I did a couple of years of university where mm. honestly I didn't study at all. I failed <laughs> yeah. all my subjects Neither because <laughs> I just spent too much time playing Counter-Strike. Yeah. And I, I'm not going to say too much time because yeah. I loved it. Yeah, it and was I, like time well spent. Exactly. Yeah. I gained so much just enjoyment and happiness out of playing CS and watching mm. myself get better and better at the game. Yeah. But also going back a bit, it was really challenging as well because mm -hmm. I was, as I was getting better and better at it, I was getting a lot more abuse. Of course. And one yeah. thing that I realized very early on in my Counter-Strike career, um, there was a gap in the meta that I realized. Mm -hmm. So in CS, you've got your AKs and your M4s, but mm -hmm. you've also got your scope rifles, yep. the SG and the AUG. Mm -hmm. And people just called them noob guns because they have scopes on them. Yeah. And you know, you're only using them if you're a noob and you need a scope because you can't hit a regular can't shot. Yeah. But I realized very early on that even though these guns were more expensive than your AK and your M4, they were so extremely good mm. and so incredible and versatile in the ways that you could use them to take on, like, you know, with an SG, mm -hmm. I could post on the same line as an AWPA. Yeah. And I could win those fights consistently with a gun that costs, like, $1,750 less mm -hmm. or whatever it is. Yeah. I just realized that these guns are so insanely bloody good. And I kind of became a bit of a force to be reckoned with and gained yeah. a very negative reputation, actually, uh, amongst a lot of players mm -hmm. because they said, oh, he's that kid that just mains the COD guns and he's not yeah, actually okay. good. Mm -hmm. Even though I was, like, climbing a lot of the ranks, getting into, like, FPLC, yeah. starting to climb up in these divisions, yeah. everyone was just harassing me all the yeah. time. They had to pick what to belittle you for. They were like, well, he's doing better than us and we don't like it, so exactly. whatever he's doing is shit and bad and noob, even so though you're, like... <laughs> exactly. Like, they give yeah. me crap for using the cod gun, mm -hmm. but if I'm using the cod gun and I'm still just absolutely wiping the floor with them. Yeah, so they should they'd... be better than you if you're just oh. using the cod gun. But then they'd get back into the disability stuff mm, because they couldn't beat me in the game. Yeah. So they've got to beat me somewhere else. Yeah. And sometimes, and honestly, they're, they're just such assholes that they, yeah. they would beat me in the game and they'll just beat me down anyway because yeah. it's not enough to them. And yeah. they, they need to know that they've absolutely destroyed the other person mentally to be mm -hmm. able to, you know, sleep at night. Feel okay, yeah, yeah exactly. with themselves, yeah. It's, 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 really, it's really depressing, but something that I'm hoping to kind of do with my platform, my profile now, and like yeah. the, my current day esports career, I guess. Mm -hmm. I don't have the time to be a professional player, mm -hmm. but it's just to be a good role model. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the time I yeah. see a lot of these popular Twitch streamers from North America and everything that... Mm -hmm. They'll stream, but they will rage all the time with their teammates and they'll get really yeah. mad and really toxic and aggressive. Mm. And it, it's not fun. Yeah. And not I only is like it not rage. fun, but it's just such a terrible role model to be able like to be exposing that to young kids that are just mm -hmm. learning about the game. Yeah. And seeing, okay, if I want to be good like this person, I, I need, need to get angry, angry at yeah. all my teammates all yeah. the time. Mm -hmm. And if they're losing, it's because they don't want to win badly enough. And it's like, yeah. no, it's not the case. Oh, I hate anger in gaming so much. Like, I used to get angry as a kid, and then I was around, you know, older boys that I was friends with who would get so angry that it was like, it made me have a moment of like, oh my God, I need to stop getting angry at games because it's just, such, it's disgusting. Like, I understand frustration. You know, I've slammed, I slammed my desk, yeah. but like, not in that, way that used to just bring this like fire of aggression and when I like see that in other people there's I almost get this like it's like revulsion I'm like oh my god like I know you're upset but like yeah yeah keep it like you're an adult yeah just just chill just please. chill you can be yeah. mad you can be like man fuck just well, the keep way, it <laughs> the way that I see it and process it back in my day I used to also be very very toxic mm. as well in yeah. large part because it was what I was exposed to all the time it's a toxic and environment yeah. you feel like you need to be toxic right back to them exactly yeah. and something that I realized was for starters if I'm so incredibly positive to the point of actually being annoying yeah. that's just as infectious and contagious yeah. as well when other people latch onto that and start being mm. positive as well but the other thing is it's understanding the reasoning behind the emotions. Mm -hmm. So I am playing this game and my teammates are losing rounds and I'm getting really angry because my teammates are losing rounds or whatever. Yeah. But it's understanding, okay, am I getting angry because they're losing rounds or whatever? But everyone wants to win. Yeah. 
how does this anger, how does this negative emotion actually help me win? It doesn't because it's Absolutely taking not. away from my ability to focus on what mm -hmm. I'm actually doing. So if I'm getting angry because I want to win, the better emotion that's going to help you win is to actually lift up the energy and the spirits of your teammates yeah. and then focus instead of on, how, oh, my teammates suck because they're leaving mid wide open and we're getting flanked. Yeah. Instead of that, just say, okay, how about we address the problem of the situation mm -hmm. and do our best. And if we lose, then it doesn't matter because you've done yeah. your best anyway. Exactly. You've tried and you haven't left the game feeling so angry that you want to punch something. Exactly. You leave and you go, man, that fuck I lost LP. Like, this is fucking shit. But like... I'm not, <laughs> it hasn't taken over my whole body and how I feel and how I'm holding all this anger. Well, it means you can go to, you can go to sleep at night and yeah. actually be like, hey, yeah. I've had a good day. I may have lost like eight ranked games in a yeah. row. You know what? I still found a way to have yeah. fun and I still did my best. But that's the thing. Like, it's frustrating. It sucks to be losing. But the next day, you don't remember that loss. Like, you're like, ah, oh, you know. That was lame that I did that, especially maybe if you're VOD reviewing and you're like high level, but like you're never ever feeling that that specific game ever again. So there's no point for you to be so angry at the time because you're just giving yourself so much grief. So something that is, it's something I've learned from my swimming career, mm -hmm. especially in the past kind of three to four years. Yeah. Results are extremely volatile and especially in such a competitive endeavor, mm -hmm. a lot of the time, you know, all the time realistically, you have control over your own processes and what you're doing, mm -hmm. but it's not up to you to win the race, ultimately. It is, yeah. you know, whoever's fastest is going to win the race, and you could do absolutely everything you possibly could to win that race, but the other person's doing that as well. And if they yeah. do that and they beat you, then how can you be upset with yourself because you've done everything that you possibly can? Mm -hmm. So it's shifting that mindset over to being very heavily process-focused and process-oriented yeah. and saying, okay, win or loss at the end of the day, you know, Sometimes people just hit these insane clutches and mm -hmm. have these crazy rounds, make these absolutely wild yeah. plays. And good on them. That's part of the thing that's really beautiful with esports is it mm -hmm. doesn't matter how up you are or how down you are. You can always make that comeback. You yeah. can always have that, you know, that crazy game, which is so incredible that they, they write books about it and yeah. stories <laughs> yeah. about it. You know, James yeah. Cameron's hitting me up because he wants to direct a movie based on this yeah. ranked game yeah. I played last week. <laughs> And I didn't get mad and it was sick. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's, it's something which is so incredibly beautiful. And I think re reminding yourself about that and saying, mm -hmm. okay, I'm down all these rounds or I've lost so much ELO. But the ELO doesn't matter because the ELO comes down to whether I'm winning or losing versus other people that are also mm -hmm. trying their best. Yeah. How about instead of that, I just focus on doing whatever I can control within my own ability to be mm -hmm. the best player that I can be. So I guess as a swimming example, I spent so long just wanting to be the best and just wanting to mm -hmm. win that all I was thinking about was that actual race in the moment kind of, where's this guy, where's this guy? I've got to move faster to catch up with him. Mm -hmm. And then shifting that over to being process-based, it's realizing, okay, there's more things that I can do in terms of understanding, all right, as I'm swimming through this lap, the fastest part of the race is the very start and you're always slowing down as the lap goes on. Mm -hmm. So how about kind of flipping that on its head and saying every lap that I race, I'm going to try and build an increase in speed mm -hmm. because if I'm if the fastest part is the beginning then I should be doing everything that I can to hold on to that speed for as long as possible mm -hmm. and as fatigue comes in the only way to hold that speed is to increase mm -hmm. so understanding those kinds of things that are really nitty-gritty uh, they could be little one percenters but yeah just bringing it down to that actual process and what you can physically control yourself means that you're going to recognize a lot more mistakes. You're going to recognize a lot of things that you can do better. Mm -hmm. And whether you win or lose, you're always getting better and you're always trying your best yeah. and you're trying to do everything within your power to do the best performance based on the processes that you know. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, you know, I'm happy, you're happy, everyone's happy, and yeah. we're all getting good. Transitioning from gaming to swimming is actually something I've done a couple of times. Mm -hmm. So I was watching myself as I was playing Counter-Strike getting better and better and better. And I recognized that I was at this point where I had uh, not that much time and I could focus on eSports mm -hmm. and take eSports and Counter-Strike more seriously and give up swimming. Or I could mm. continue swimming and really put everything into the pool. Yeah. Because I think much to the credit of eSports, mm. you really need to put so much everything in yeah to being a pro player Especially i think that saying everything is kind of 
I think there's a lot of risk associated to putting everything into this one mm -hmm. kind of chase, mm -hmm. this one vertical, because um, it's important to have balance. I've found in my swimming career, this is actually what I found when I gave up Counter-Strike to focus on swimming completely mm -hmm. full time. I put so much pressure on myself to compete in swimming because it was all that I had that when it came to the big major competition at World Champs, although I was absolutely fit and strong and like powerful enough to be able to win, uh, I came third in both of my two events. Mm -hmm. And third is still damn good. Yeah, fuck yeah. But I knew I could have done better if yeah. I had nailed my processes and done everything mm -hmm. right and mm -hmm. made the most of the opportunities. And a big part of that was having that balance so I didn't crack under the pressure at the very top. Yeah. Um, I guess going back a little bit anyway. Um, I recognized that in Counter-Strike, I was getting to that point where I was kind of starting to play in competitions and play amongst teams that were like top eight in the region, qualifying for FPL and these mm -hmm. kinds of things. And I could get better, mm -hmm. but I needed to invest more time. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't have that time. So I said, all right, instead of that, I'm just going to cut CS completely. And I discovered as a part of cutting CS completely that it turns out you really can't compete that well in swimming on five hours of sleep every night. Yeah. So I would, I would train from 4 till 6 p.m. Mm -hmm. at home. Uh, then I'd get back home. Like, mum and dad would cook me dinner. They'd be waiting for me as soon as I walk in the mm -hmm. door at 10 past 6. I'd eat dinner really quickly and then get online at 6.30 for yeah. prac, 6.30 till, like, 10, 10.30 even. And then I'd play, like, one or two games of FPL. It'd be midnight when I go to bed, and then I wake up at 5 a.m. to get to the pool at 5.30 yeah. the next day. So you did, like, pool, gap, pool, games? I would... Sleep. I was doing a lot more than just pool gap pool games. So yeah, going yeah, back yeah. to the that idea of process and wanting to do everything I could to be as good as possible. Um, ultimately, I ended up using a big part of that gap in the middle of the day to just sleep, yeah. to catch up on yeah. the fact that I only had five hours of sleep. <laughs> yeah, as you, should, as you should be. But I would also do heaps and heaps of aim practice. Of so aim practice? Mm -hmm. Having a physical disability that mm -hmm. impairs my coordination and my fine motor skills, I recognize that to be able to compete and aim at the same level as the other players, I needed to invest significantly more mm. time in improving those mechanics and improving those skills. Even though I used the cod guns and the things on the side, that wasn't enough to cut it because you yeah. still need to have that raw mechanical ability. Mm -hmm. So I would grind so hard just sitting in like aim bots and 1v1 servers and these kinds of things, just practicing and practicing and trying to get as good and as cons consistent as possible in my aim. Mm -hmm. And then I would also spend time doing VOD reviews of scrims from previous evenings or VOD reviewing like pugs as well. Yeah. Just trying to look for mistakes that I'm making and like recognizing and fixing these mistakes or learning made lineups and just all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I recognized from my swimming career that you need to be very deliberate about your approach to sport mm -hmm. to excel and to reach the elite level. And in esports, a lot of people don't do that. I find a lot of people say they want to be pro and they just grind pugs for eight hours a day yeah. and that's it. And I feel like something that made so much success for me to be able to play at the level that I did in Counter-Strike was because I took so many of those extra steps to try and become the best player. Mm -hmm. Because if I just sat there and played pugs all day every day, then I don't think I would have made up the difference that I needed in terms of the tactical understanding and that mm -hmm. to make up for my disability that holds me back mechanically. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I played Counter-Strike, then quit Counter-Strike to focus on swimming, mm -hmm. realized I needed balance and recognized that. So I said, all right, I'm gonna go back to uni and study for a little bit. And I did that for about all of four or five weeks <laughs> and then COVID hit. Oh, okay. And COVID hit. Oh shit, really? And in large part because of my prior experience with university mm -hmm. and saying, hey, I'm motivated to do this degree. I wasn't motivated to do this degree. <laughs> um, I said, okay, I'm going to defer from this university course mm -hmm. and I will wait until this COVID lockdown lifts, which will just be next semester. Mm -hmm. It won't be that long. And yeah, then I'll get, yeah. back, I'll get be, back into study. Like, yeah. right? So I'm locked up in the house. Mm -hmm. There's nothing to do. I can't do swimming training or anything. And I'm a very competitive person, so I need something that's legitimately competitive to do, or mm. I will just, you know, I'll be bouncing yeah. all over the walls and I'll yeah. be going crazy. Yeah. So thankfully, Valorant was coming out around this time. Yes. It so was. that's how yeah. I got involved in Valorant. Was hey, this is a new thing. It's a competitive avenue mm -hmm. and opportunity. Mm -hmm. 
and I mean, it looks like fun. A bunch of my friends are playing it mm -hmm. from Counter Strike, and I need to do this, or I'll just yeah go insane. insane. <laughs> yeah. So I said, all right, I'm going to play some Valorant. Mm -hmm. So I got on it, chatting to a couple of different people, saying, hey, like I think I have a lot to add to a team, mm -hmm. but I'm looking for a team to see who's who's kind of around, who's got some slots available. So I found after talking to Crunchy. Um, he said that, oh, there's a couple of Fortnite players that I know that are looking for a fifth. Mm -hmm. So I said, all right, sounds awesome. So I'll join them. Yep. Uh, so I had a trial with them and they signed me on the f after the first night of scrims or something. Because oh, they just loved awesome. the, the attitude and the mindset and everything yeah. that I brought you to it. Well. And mm. like, they're just funny guys. Yeah, honestly. yeah. Um, so I joined after the first day. Mm -hmm. uh, it was team pants down. And we were very well known in the early days for kind of being four Fortnite players and a fish. <laughs> yeah, okay. the, the other four players, uh, so that was Twiz, Cover, Westy, mm. and Super Trooper. I know of Twiz. I know that name. Honestly, I actually had to think about what their usernames are. Yes. Our, our bonds is like the boys. Yeah. They're so close that I know them as first name basis. Oh, yeah, of course. And from the very yeah. early days in our team, like, yeah, it's what, Twiz, Cover, whatever, whatever. <laughs> but I know them as like Sam, Jesse, Chris, Hawani. Mm -hmm. And absolute boys. Still yeah. love them. Our That's Discord good. chat is still active even though oh. we just ended like two years ago. Sweet. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, That's like so that... Uh, <laughs> it's like that copy pasta that's like yeah I know him by his first name I call him that because we're friends yeah yeah exactly <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't know him like that yeah, yeah. We're, we know each other really well so I get to call him by Rowan <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, really exactly. cool <laughs> first name Daisy. Yeah, yeah so rad continue um, so we're playing and playing and we're doing really well mm. domestically we're mm -hmm. kind of at this point we're already in that top six to top four mm -hmm. Amongst all the other teams in beta, and we're playing on like 220, 220 milliseconds of ping, North yep. American servers, absolutely yep. <laughs> scuffed as heck. Yep. But we're just going for it anyway, because yeah. that's what we have. Um, and we're grinding away, and I say, hey, I've found a lot of benefit out of working with a sports psychologist in yeah. Sydney. So I'd love to bring uh, this sports psychologist that works in esports, oh, Michelle, amazing. who I absolutely love. <laughs> yeah. I really want to bring her on board yeah. to this esports team. So oh. I, I spoke to the other boys and they weren't Preach. too sure. <laughs> and eventually, like, you know, we had them meeting with Michelle, who mm. I absolutely loved a bit. And the boys agreed to it, which is nice. Uh, Michelle said she really wanted to work with the team. And that was great. It was a massive financial investment on my front mm -hmm. um, because, or well, she's a professional. Yeah. And I, I paid for it out of my own pocket. Oh, good on you. No sponsors, nothing else like that. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of money that was saved up because I wanted to go on a massive European holiday after mm -hmm. the Tokyo Paralympics. Yeah. Never got to do that because the Paralympics weren't happening. Yeah. So I have a bunch of money sitting in a bank account and I want to do that. I want to put that towards something. So I'm going to mm -hmm. put it towards team pants down. <laughs> good. And working with Michelle was so absolutely incredible. Just the things that we kind of learnt in mm. terms of, like, I expected everything in sports psychology for esports to be about tilt and just about managing mm. managing the negative emotions and stuff. And a good amount of it is. Yeah. But everything is communication. Yeah. Because ultimately, you will always have good rounds and bad rounds, but no individual player will win a match for a team. I don't care who the player is. You can be buddy yay playing for Optics, simple playing for Navi, mm -hmm. whatever else. It's always going to come down to how well you mesh and work together as a team. And the, a lot of the work we did with Michelle was just based purely on, okay, how can we communicate as well as possible mm -hmm. to be the best team that we can be, as well as enabling us further to be able to, you know, run better strategies and everything because we're more efficient with our calls mm. and just, like, even the, the team bonding kind of stuff. Like, she had such an incredibly massive impact and not just that, she kind of taught us as well how to have a lot more fun. Oh, yeah. And also how to deal with the really, really crappy situations. Yeah. Because every single team, again, don't care who you are, who you're playing for, yep. you're going to have arguments. Yep. Things are going to come up. There's going to be drama. Mm -hmm. And Michelle made sure that we never left the Discord upset. So we would always air whatever dirty laundry or whatever it is. Good. And we made sure that it was always a safe environment so that we could say what it was that we wanted to say. Mm -hmm. And we would come to an agreement no matter how long that took. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, I didn't have swimming at this time because COVID lockdowns. Yeah. Otherwise, like, I would have lost a lot of sleep because we had some nights that we'd go into very 
late and in-depth arguments about whether or not aim training is actually yeah, worth it in yeah, esports okay. or whatever. And I know, like, Chris in particular, he absolutely hated aim training and said, yeah. why would I do that when I can just play the game? Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pros and cons both ways, whatever, yeah. whatever. Um, but Michelle's impact was really, really great because it made sure that we didn't end up hating each other. We disconnected, mm -hmm. saying, I hate this person because they, their opinions and beliefs are slightly different to mine or something. Yeah. Uh, that regardless of disagreements, we'd always just come together, come to the same conclusion, and just focus on what we're actually there to do, which is mm -hmm. to play the best that we can to win more Valor. Mm -hmm. So yeah, she was really, really awesome to work with. And we got better and better and better at Valorant. We started playing in some of the Australian tournaments and placing quite well in that top four kind of range. And then swimming started again. So I started swimming right. and started balancing a bit of Valorant. And I reached that same stage where I could pursue Valorant full time. Mm -hmm. I could pursue swimming full time. And I could put more time into Valorant and get better. But I saw greater opportunities within swimming. It was kind of a risk-reward play where I know I'm already so close to making Australian teams in swimming or on Australian teams. Yeah. Whereas in esports, there's a risk where I could put this Huge effort in. Huge risk. Yeah. And honestly, I, I still believe I absolutely could get there. Yeah. If I get injured and like I need a shoulder reconstruction and it's still bad and they can't swim anymore, mm -hmm. I have absolute faith in my ability to reach an international mm -hmm. professional level in esports. That's awesome. Um, I just don't have the time to do that on top of swimming. Yeah, fuck no. <laughs> uh, yeah. Believe it or not. Yeah. So I kind of said, all right, boys, I think that this is kind of my time. We'll play this one last tournament together. Mm -hmm. We'll just have a lot of fun through it. And then that will be the end of the pants down kind of chapter. Mm -hmm. And everyone else kind of agreed. At this point, we were getting large enough and having a big enough following where we all kind of had to come to that conclusion together because mm. uh, it was either we pursue more within esports and we start to chase sponsors and do these kinds of things for our team or it's just no longer financially viable. I'm quite lucky in that I have funding from swimming to pursue mm. that and to be able to like afford a board to live at home and pay for food and those kinds of things. Mm. Whereas some of the other guys, like they're working part-time jobs so they can put yeah. more time into esports and they don't have enough money to sustain themselves. Mm. Ultimately, something which is very, very often forgotten about in all sport or esports or whatever, it's expensive to be good. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. so much of it just comes back to the bank of mum and dad. Yeah. I, I've seen countless athletes as well as countless players in esports that have so much promise that have had to yeah. eventually retire from sport or give up their dreams because they turn 18 and they need to get a job to can't be able to support it. themselves. Yeah. And it's either they can't afford to live or they don't have the time to focus on yeah. their skill and their development. That's so sad. It's heartbreaking. Yeah. But it's, it's sport. Yeah, so, it is. Yeah. If it came down to it, if you know swimming wasn't an option, if you were like guaranteed full time, which would you pick, CS:GO or Valorant? CS or Valorant? Uh huh. Honestly, I'd pick Valorant. Why? Do you so, like the game more, or do you feel like it's more viable as a? I think that they're both extremely viable. Yeah. In their own different ways. Yeah. So Valorant is very heavily. They're both obviously very heavily publisher back. But Counter-Strike has a lot more opportunities for players to go professional because there's so many more different tournaments with large prize pools. Yeah, more I mean, Riot tiers. owns all the Valorant stuff, so, like... And they have an absolute bloody stranglehold by, on yeah. everything. Absolutely, so. they're like, this is our IP, you can't touch it. Yeah. But uh, Valve is like, you want to run a tournament? Yeah, exactly. Go on. I think, um, but in that sense, the reason why I'm so much more passionate for Valorant as mm -hmm. opposed to Counter-Strike is... The, the accessibility of Valorant mm -hmm. as a player. Something that I struggled with in Counter-Strike was in large part the, the difficulty with so much additional muscle memory that I needed to learn spray control. Okay. So a major part of why I used the scope rifles in CS was because uh, the spray pattern spray. was yeah. just down to the left or yeah. down to the right. Yeah. Just that one line, that one direction, and you hold it for a bit, mm. and that's kind of all you really needed to learn. Yeah. Whereas with an AK, it's like down, left, right, left, yeah. and you need to learn so many different angles and like exact movements. Yeah. Whereas the SG and the org were just like very, very simple and basic, and okay. that worked well for my disability because mm -hmm. I have very poor muscle memory. Yeah. In Valorant, it's just straight down and then it's random. 
Comic controller. For every gun? I'm sorry, I have not played for, Valorant. For the, for, the fan, for the Vandal and for the Phantom, yeah. it's like moving at different speeds because the guns have different firing rates. Yeah. But it's still single movements and single directions, right, okay. which works really well for me. Yeah. The other thing is in terms of accessibility and Valorant. Um, something which I absolutely love talking about. Although I don't have a visual disability, mm -hmm. um, the, the clarity around smokes is so much better in Valor compared to Counter-Strike. So? so in Counter-Strike, let's say you're throwing a one-way smoke at a window on a Mirage, mm -hmm. and you need to be able to tell the difference between this shade of grey and this very slightly different shade of grey. Okay. Or like knowing that this is the border of the smoke, but it might not be the border of the smoke. It could be a one-way, it couldn't be. I get that that's a part of the mechanics mm -hmm. of the game and that's a part of that. Like, it's important to understand what one ways look like. Just, it's game sense. Yeah. But in Valorant, it is so extremely obvious to know mm. instantly what a one-way smoke is because they all have these clear-cut, well-defined lines. Okay. And in that sense, it's so much easier as a player to just watch and pick up exactly what's kind of going on in front of you because there's just that same level of visual clarity and distinct mm. elements for what's on your screen instead of two very slightly different shades <laughs> of exactly the same colour mm -hmm. as well as having uh, colourblind options and modes and everything. Yeah. I think Valorant has done a very great job in the accessibility front. Mm. So it lines up more with my passion for diversity and inclusion within gaming because mm -hmm. ultimately Valorant is a more accessible product for more people with disability who want to take the game seriously and be competitive. Mm. Um, they're both still pretty bad yeah. in a lot of senses, yeah. honestly. Yeah. But I think something that's very important to remember with all of accessibility and disability and everything, it's like regular sports as well. Like, mm. you're never going to be able to cater to every single crowd. Yeah, it's not it's a blanket about, solution. It's about maximising the level of accessibility. Yeah. And I think that Valorant is just, I think it's very clear to everyone in my opinion, that it is a more accessible product mm -hmm. than CS. Mm -hmm. The part where I disagree with that is the spectator experience. Right, okay. It is so difficult to watch a Valorant game mm -hmm. as a spectator and see what's going on because yeah. there's just mess everywhere. And it's like some little kid just threw up all over the monitor. Yeah. Just colors it's and crap <laughs> everywhere. That reminds me of like Overwatch. Yeah, 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 exactly. How it's just a nightmare. So fun to play, so hard to spectate. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so much. But in Counter-Strike, a smoke is a smoke. Yeah. There's only one kind of smoke and that looks exactly like a smoke does. Yes. A flashbang is a flash, a nade is a nade, a gun is a gun, mm. or so, et cetera. It's all so much more easily defined looking at it from the top down yeah and it's also having less crazy agents with wacky abilities and well that's stuff. it that's no abilities yeah so because there's no abilities there's a lower barrier for entry for a mm -hmm. spectator to understand what's happening mm -hmm. my, my big example with that is like league of legends or dota mm -hmm. i have no idea what the hell is going on when i try to watch league <laughs> yeah or dota uh -huh. like I, I tried to watch the international the other day yeah. and i'm watching this thing and they're talking about like a day night cycle or something and not knowing the game, I literally thought they were talking about like what the games are going to look like this evening oh, for right. like the next teams okay. that are playing in yeah. a couple hours yeah. without knowing. No, it's an actual game mechanic. Yeah. That there's like a day cycle. Or it's whatever. funny you say that. I, I find myself speaking about that a lot, especially at events like MEO or speaking to. Uh, I find myself speaking to Uber drivers about this a lot because they're like, "What do you do?" And I'm like, uh, "Have you heard of esports?" Like blah blah blah. Um, you know, coming from originally a league person, I, it's so hard, as you were saying, to come in and like, say you're at MEO or you're at somewhere and a league thing's on and someone's like, come watch league with me and you sit down and you've never fucking seen a MOBA before and you're like, what? I don't understand, what's an, especially for LOL, what's a Nexus? Like, why, what are they doing? What are the lanes? But you sit down and watch CSGO and you go, oh, guy shoots guy in head, plant bomb, boom. You, you like lost me at Nexus. Well, yeah. exactly, but yeah. so there's like, it feels like, you know, MOBAs and a lot of other games have this kind of like language around it, whereas CS, obviously, like when you're playing professionally, it's, you know, worlds more intricate. Well, that, that's the thing that I love about CS. Yeah. Actually, I quite like this about Rocket League as well, yeah. in that they are very easy for a spectator to understand without yeah. prior experience. So of the marketable. Game. But the more experience you have of the game, the more you can see the beauty that's kind mm. of within. It's the same with fighting games. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can sit and you go, oh, he punched him, but like, it's, 
50 more layers. Or it's from like, that. you know, Evo Moment 37. It looks yeah. incredible to just your average Joe that's watching this thing. And then you realise it's what seventeen or eighteen different like frame perfect inputs, yeah. And <laughs> yeah. perfect timings yes. and positionings and like everything like that. Mm -hmm. And it's like it's it's beautiful. It's what makes esports so beautiful. Agreed. Um, that's what I love about those kinds of titles. Where League of Legends is still exactly the same, no doubt. That the skill ceiling is so incredibly mm. high, and the tactical knowledge and everything is just immense. But they're hard games to watch if you yes. don't play. Yeah, there's a barrier of entry. Yeah. yeah. There isn't a perfect eSport. Oh, fuck no. And going back to this whole accessibility, diversity kind of argument, it's what I kind of love about it as well, is mm. that, you know, regardless of what your disability is, there's opportunities to compete. Agreed. If you have an uh, extremely limiting physical disability and you use a powered chair mm -hmm. and you have extremely low control of your motor function, you could still play Hearthstone. Mm. Like, yeah. there's still options, there's still opportunities. Mm. I'm, I'm really interested to see over time... I think particularly with console-based esports, um, I'd love to see a Rocket League Pro that mm. uses the Xbox adaptive controllers yeah. and uses these kinds of setups that look so unique and so foreign because it works for them and their capability mm -hmm. and their disability, but they've made it work for them to mm -hmm. be able to play it, whatever their potential is, regardless of what's being created for the masses and for other people to use. It's something that... I know there's people out there and I know there's the talent that's out there for these mm. people with disability. Um, speaking from personal experience within Valorant, like playing overseas as well as playing in Australia, like I say playing overseas, but it's more like I take a setup with me when I travel yeah, overseas yeah. and I just play ranked games. Yeah. And I've met other players internationally with disability. I've mm -hmm. met international female players. And there are some seriously cracked gamers out there yeah. that do have a diverse background compared to your straight white male yeah. <laughs> like archetype of your average esports pro yeah and it's the opportunities for these players to be able to perform and to be able to be more successful which is kind of that's the thing that i feel is missing from a lot of the diversity inclusion mm. kind of thing and it's not necessarily a thing of okay to fix female participation in esports we need more female only competitions yeah. because something that uh i I don't know if I coined this, but I thought of it the other day and I love it. It's diversity and exclusion mm -hmm. because a lot of these opportunities and things you see that come up, it's saying, hey, we care so much about women, we're going to create a female league. Yeah. But is there a pathway from that female league into being yeah. integrated and included in an overall professional esports environment? Mm -hmm. Or is it just the female league is the best that women can get? Yeah. Because then it's not inclusion, it's yeah. exclusion by definition. Mm -hmm. It's... Esports has this incredible potential and capacity to be truly inclusive. Like in traditional sport, you have male and female sport. Mm -hmm. You have Olympic swimming. You have Paralympic swimming. No matter how good I am as a swimmer, mm -hmm. I will always be limited in my physical ability from being able to compete to the best of the best at an international level in able-bodied swimming. Mm -hmm. That's just the nature of the disability and the nature of my body. Mm -hmm. That's not the case in esports. So why do we have so many of these separate leagues? Mm. I understand the opportunity needs to be there, but I feel like the opportunity needs to be extended with these pathways further on from that. Yeah. To get some of these insanely cracked, goaded female players or players yeah. with disability on mainstream teams with mm -hmm. cis, white, able-bodied men. Yeah. Because they, they're good enough for it. Yeah. I really like your point talking about like the pathways. Whenever there becomes like a new women's league... There's always, uh, you know, everyone's opinions. Everyone's entitled to their opinions. Um, personally, I think women-only leagues are great because, you know, give the women a chance, Absolutely. obviously. But I really like what you're saying. It's like, okay, but then what are the pathways? I absolutely agree with you. I yeah. think that there needs to be, like, safe spaces. Exactly. I think that especially for female players... Yeah the amount of abuse that I have copped myself for being a male player with a disability mm. is massive. Yeah. And that's a disability that I can kind of hide in an online environment. Mm. If you're a woman, yeah. it can be very, very difficult to hide your gender. Yeah, you I don't know, want to speak in a game. I know so <laughs> yeah. many women that are really, really good at Valorant that refuse yeah. to use their microphones yeah. because they are so scared of the abuse and the mm -hmm. hate that they'll cop from anonymous jet insta locks that just yeah. want to like spew absolute garbage in the microphone yeah and that breaks disgusting. my heart and that's where i think that there's an 
there is a legitimate need for that kind of safe space where yeah. women can be themselves, they can communicate. Can well, that's it. Give them a place where they can be comfortable, can play to the best of their ability, knowing that they're not going to be called a fat bitch and like can prove themselves without having to carry the mental weight of like, yeah, someone fucking harassing them a game. And then, you know, then you're fostering talent in a comfortable environment where they might, you know, finally get the confidence to perform the best that they can because they're not bogged down by all this vitriol over here. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that a lot of, there are a lot of competitions coming up and there's always more for female esports and mm -hmm. it's great. But without the opportunities for those female players to then be integrated into the top leagues, regardless of gender, yeah. then I worry that as an industry, male and female esports will divide further and further yeah. and you'll have that segregation where it's just not necessary at all. I hope it does change and I, you know, I think to a level it will. It's like, this is, this is going to be a little bit cringe of me to bring up, I don't know if you know I'm like quite a big wrestling fan. And so I grew up watching wrestling when I was very young and being a young woman into a male dominated thing, which I always am with gaming, my music, Sorry to cut everything. you off. Does this mean you're going to put me through the table back here? Or <laughs> I wish. I fucking wish. Um, <laughs> Do I have to worry about like <laughs> no. the chair that's over here or something? You just no, like, yeah, yeah, just you wait. Skull. Just you wait. You'll hear a theme song come on. You'll be like, holy shit, all the lights will turn off. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, so I grew up watching, you know, being seven and loving wrestling, but all the rest, women wrestlers I watched had to do bra and panties matches. You know, they weren't allowed to do an actual match. They had to do a match where they came out in skimpy clothing and the way the other woman won was by undressing her. And like, this is just the shit that I grew up with and you know, it was normal and whatever. Like, I love a bra and panties match in my internalized misogyny way. I'm like, you're hot and you're doing sick stuff. That's awesome. But when you're just reduced to the stuff, to that now. so. Now it's like, what, two decades later, and I've had this moment of like watching wrestling where there has been, you know, obviously there's still very fundamental issues with the way women are treated compared to men, but the attitude has changed so much. All the women wrestlers are treated as so uh, equal. Um, they make, uh, not all of them, but a lot of them make as much money as all the men do. Um, a lot of them are main, uh, main eventing some of the biggest events in the world um, and it's been so crazy to watch this other thing this other male dominated thing that I'm really into have this total change in the way women are treated and how uh, valid they are in this thing that they fucking care about so much and then to you know be working in esports and just be like <laughs> you know look there's an example we can look forward towards um, you know, so I, I guess my point is like, well, I've seen it in wrestling, which is very sexist and fucked and whatever. It's changed there. So like, hopefully it can change in esports. <laughs> it's well, my, my we, we all know maybe two decades. Can, we all know <laughs> that it can change and we all know that it has the capacity for greatness. Yeah. But it's recognizing that and saying, okay, how do we create that change? Mm -hmm. What do we need to do? And I think that's where, at least to me, a lot of my experience with an esports comes down to being a player, as yeah. well as my experience in sport, in yeah. swimming. And it's saying, okay, as a player, what do I need to be able to compete with the other guys? Mm -hmm. So at the very start of my swimming career, um, way, way, way back before I was qualifying for teams or doing any of this stuff, doing Learn to Swim, um, I was 10, year, 10 years old, swimming with the five-year-old kids mm -hmm. because... I couldn't coordinate, couldn't move my yeah. arms and legs properly, and the learn to swim teachers were like, okay, you cannot move out of this class until you can learn to do this movement, that movement, the other kind of stuff properly, mm -hmm. which my brain just does not allow me to do. Yeah. So it's recognizing that and saying, okay, well, you may not be able to do this or that or whatever because of your disability, but you can still do the laps, you can yeah. still build fitness and build that baseline. So we can work with these things. We know your kicks are always going to be garbage because you can't coordinate your legs. That's just reality. Yeah. So let's focus on your strengths and mm -hmm. focus on the things that you can do. And it was through realizing and discovering that alternative pathway that I found you know, abilities to increase in like what I'm doing, to be able mm -hmm. to get better at what I'm doing. And it's absolutely not me trying to directly say, you know, being a woman in sport is one-to-one -one identical to no. having a disability in yeah. sport or something. It's all it's, different it, for every single person. Exactly. Yeah. But it's just knowing that there are, there's that need for those 
not just alternative pathways or whatever, just pathways in general yes. to be included in whatever the top squads are doing or the mm -hmm. top teams are doing or whatever. If you have that pathway that allows people to be included if they're good enough, then they can be included for being good enough. And you don't have women that are so insanely talented that they could be on these top Valorant teams or Counter-Strike mm. teams that are missing out on the opportunities because there's no pathway yeah. and because they're stuck in the female leagues. Mm -hmm. That's something that I'm so worried about, not just with female esports, but speaking with different sponsors and brands that are interested in uh, how they can engage disability within gaming and disability within esports. Mm. And I know there was one example that was brought up to me a while ago that says, okay, how about we do a, a charity tournament where we hire, well, hire, we get a bunch of players with disability and we play these like people with disability versus each other. Mm. It'll look really cool. We'll get the publisher of this game behind it. Yeah. The great exposure for the brand, for the game, for the players with disability. Everyone's going to watch it and it'll be like, oh, wow, these people with disability are actually really good. <laughs> no one's going to watch that at all mm. because these players with disability, they don't have any like notoriety with yeah. the community for being good. Yeah. They're just a bunch of rants. What's going to pull the people who aren't paying attention in. So you yeah. build these pathways, or you, let's say you do it as a community one-off activation or whatever, mm. where you have, let's say, a bunch of top like Counter-Strike players. Let's say, well, well, ignore the disability stuff. Mm. Let's say you have a show match before a major grand final, where you have two teams, and these teams, I feel like both teams have two top professional players from top Counter-Strike teams. The caches. And then Love. three top female players. Oh, yes. And you verse them against each other. They're still mixed teams. Yeah. But I guarantee you, you put two top men and three top women in these teams, you look at the scoreboards at the end of the match, it's not going to be man, man, woman, woman, woman. It's going to be a bit all over the shop. Yeah. Not just, because, not just because that's the nature of how the game works, but it's also because the women are good. Yeah. They're good at the game. Yeah. So just Give them the bloody chance yeah. and they'll show it. Agreed. I can rant about this oh. one thing for like no, so it. long. Like, I love Again, I'm, I'm not a woman. I don't, <laughs> really? I, really? Believe it or not. <laughs> what? Like, I, I don't identify I as female or anything. Yes. But I do have the experience of coming from a background with diversity. Absolutely. Having a disability. Mm -hmm. And I've seen the incredible power and impact that having those kinds of competitive opportunities has mm -hmm. because it literally changed my life. Yeah. And having those greater opportunities to be able to compete at the true legitimate top end in esports could be incredible because that doesn't exist in traditional sports. Actually, I'll, I'll correct that. Something that's just really, really incredible. I think, I forget how many of the are. I think there's either three or there's four uh, women on the Australian wheelchair rugby team. Mm. So it's the men's rugby team. But there oh, are women really? that are on. Oh, the men's rugby team. It's fucking rad. Because they're just really good. And yeah. I don't know if you've ever watched like wheelchair rugby. I haven't. You, you told me not to do this before, but I'm looking at the camera. Oh, no, I'm saying, you, could, you could do this Watch now. wheelchair rugby, honestly. Yeah? It is by far the toughest sport yeah? you'll ever see. Like, I can see that. They say, oh, they've already broken their necks. What else do they have to lose kind of thing? <laughs> because yeah, they're yeah, in these yeah, chairs and they yeah. are just absolutely like gunning for each other at max speed, like slamming into each other. No fear at all, because yeah. like they can't feel their legs. Yeah. Like, who cares if they get absolutely the smashed and everything? That's like, fucking awesome. It's just absolutely just ramming into each other. Mm -hmm. I barely know the rules for it. I just it's just violent. <laughs> it's as just all awesome. Hell. Yeah. And it is so much fun. Yeah. But it's really really cool to see that in this kind of sport. Again, it's a niche sport. It's mm -hmm. a disability sport. But there are women competing in the men's leagues mm -hmm. because they're just good at what they do. Yeah. It's so cool. Watch it. Please. Yeah. <laughs> Watch it. There's so much negative stigma about gamers, especially like in mainstream media of like, oh, lazy, dirty, lives in their mom's basement, blah, blah, blah. But obviously like that's not the real narrative, at least on like, for most people on like a high professional scale. Um, being someone who comes from traditional sports and then also being a part of esports, are there any, I mean, obviously there would be, but what, what uh, similarities have you seen um, you know, things that you can apply from swimming into being in a professional esports team, whether that comes from, you know, being in a team, practicing, all of that. Um, yeah, what, do you just, what are the similarities that you see that maybe the uh, normie wouldn't 
ascribe to a gamer? So I think that it's something that I can only speak from my own experiences. Of course. And a of part course. of that is understanding that my traditional sport experience is an individual sport mm. where I'm practicing a pre-rehearsed movement. Ultimately, of okay. although there are slight differences in everything between different swimming pools, environments, mm. etc., a 100 meters freestyle is a 100 meters freestyle. Yeah. A freestyle stroke is a freestyle stroke. Whereas mm. in esports, yeah, sure, a gun is a gun, like whatever, all mm. that stuff. But there's so much more volatility and so much more difference where every round you play is always going to be different. Mm -hmm. I don't have that to the same extent in swimming. Mm -hmm. uh, in some ways, that's what I actually really love about esports because it's always changing, it's always new. Yeah, it's different. That means there's always ways to come back no matter how far down you are. Mm, like the I, variables are I'm always... down bad in more ways than one, but at least like in <laughs> yeah. game, I can come back from I can from figure it, out how know? to fix it. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think the similarities between the two of them is so much of it just comes down to that discipline that you need to be good. I think that talent can only get you so far. Mm -hmm. And talent is something that is very much, I think, in the esports space kind of misunderstood. I think that, yeah, you can get really good off of just playing ranked games and doing whatever. But ultimately, if you want to get to that top level, it doesn't matter how good you are individually, you will only get picked up for a major team if you show that you have a good work ethic, if you're mm. willing to put in the hard yards, if you're willing to do all of your theory, practice, your VOD reviews, all those kinds of other things, which is like, it's the boring stuff. You don't get the funny dopamine hits like you do <laughs> from just playing a ranked game and hitting mm. an ice clutch or whatever. <laughs> but it's still, it takes a lot of that discipline. And the other thing which is really incredible about like all of that, and, you know, the, the work ethic that's associated, it's those communication skills. And it is that team, that teamwork, that team building kind of thing. It's elements that I've discovered more and more as I progress later into my sport and esports career. It's relatable to all walks of life. It's not just a thing of what I learn in swimming is only good in swimming. It's everything else. It's like learning about how um, being more specific and process oriented has led to greater success than being results oriented in swimming. Mm -hmm. I've been able to apply that towards other conversations where let's say I spent so long looking for sponsors because it's like, hey, I've done all this cool stuff and give me money and I'll promote, promote your product. Yeah. Turns out no one wants to do that. Yeah. But if I approach a conversation with a sponsor and I say, hey, I am so passionate about diversity and inclusion because I'm legitimately, I care so much about it. I think that esports, gaming, whatever it is, is just so much fun and I want as many people as possible to be able to access that. Yeah. I tell these stories to a sponsor and they're like, wow, this sounds amazing. How can we work together yeah. to create this what kind of What can we do to give you that platform? It's learning yeah. that being values and process oriented and all that kind of thing across the board, whether it's, you know, within sport, within esports, within sponsorship, within business, whatever it is, that approach will guarantee success because it's authentic. Yeah. And it's kind of selfless in a way as well, mm -hmm. because like, at least for me, a big thing that I realized after the Tokyo Paralympics mm -hmm. and something that motivates me so much to being, like towards being a competitor, towards being at this top kind of level, a lot of it is like, you know, loving being the best that I can be and mm. seeing how far I can take what I'm doing. Yeah. But it's this 30 second window that I get. At the end of my major competitions, I have this tiny little interview mm. with uh, whoever it is, the lovely lady from Channel 7 or whatever. And I have literally millions of people that are watching this live broadcasted interview. And I can use that opportunity to say, yeah, you know, I swam pretty well. You know, it was good fun. You know, <laughs> I had a bit of a laugh. Yeah, it was And sick. like, don't get me wrong, like, I'm all for a bit of banter. Like, yeah. you know, I played for Team Pants Down and I gave the Pants Down boys a shout out in my interview <laughs> after winning my gold medal <laughs> yeah, at Tokyo. As you like, should. Because I mean, it's the boys. You yeah. know, you've got to hype them up. You've got to. But with that window and that opportunity, I can also use that to create significant difference and mm -hmm. positive change. So now a major thing that I'm motivated by is saying, okay, if I can be really good at this media stuff, and I can also work as hard as I can to be the best athlete that I can be, mm -hmm. and then I can make the most of these little 30 second windows to inspire young people with or without a disability to make some kind of positive change in their lives. Mm -hmm. If I can do the best that I can as far as developing and promoting my own brand, then I can share more important messages about diversity and inclusion or being a positive influence towards others in the gaming scene and doing yeah. these kinds of things. It's like, 
not only am I finding greater success by being value oriented, but I'm having a lot more fun and a lot happier. <laughs> yeah. Honestly. Yeah. I know that doesn't answer the initial question. No, no, I went please. off on a tangent, but it's just like, I just, uh, no matter what I'm doing, I think success is fleeting. Yeah. At the end of the day, I've already got my gold medals and they'll always be there. And that's pretty yeah. damn cool and to be able to say. It's still. Rad. Honestly. <laughs> Very cool. But I'll, I mean, in a few years' time, I say no one's going to care about them. I'll always care about them. Absolutely. But mon like prize money, sponsorship endorsements, all these things, they come and they go. Mm. All that like money, fame, success it comes and it goes. Mm. But you can make an impact and you can make a difference with what you have in the moment. So what I'm wanting to do, regardless of what the hell happens to me, because yeah. I've found so much happiness through my journey, is to just spread that happiness to other people in whatever way that I can. I think that's so important just in like, you know, it's fleeting. Everything you do, especially in your young age, can always be fleeting. But if you set up these uh, pillars of, you know, uh, advocating for other people, advocating for yourself, um, speaking up, being a good role model, you know, that's that can keep going forever. Even if, you know, uh, you can't swim anymore, or you can't play anymore, um, you can still be that person who has always stood up for people and stood up for yourself, and you can keep being that person. You can move into other things and still be the person who says, like, exactly, let's yeah. do some good shit. Let's well, do it, it always sounds nihilistic to say, you know, everything sucks, we're all going to die one day. What's the point? <laughs> I don't think that's nihilistic. Like, I think that's just reality. It's, it's reality. <laughs> in a good way. In a good way, exactly. Yeah. It's saying, you know, with my with my reality, with my experiences, like, yeah. I have found so much happiness. I found success through doing all of these things. Yeah. And yeah, sure, that success may go away. But if I can share the messages about the things I've done to find this happiness to other people, then I can give other people the opportunity to feel the same way. Yeah. And that is, that's what creating a legacy and doing all this kind of stuff mm. to me is like really about and is what I'm trying to do. It's not like to say, hey, I want to be famous so I can make a ton of money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just like, yeah. I'm so happy with everything that I've done and I want other people to be happy as well. Yeah. Might just turn off while you're talking, but yeah. ignore that. Um, no, I totally agree. And I think, you know, being people, especially in esports, who are kind of, because it's such a new industry and we can be at the forefront of it, um, you know, experiencing these things, granted in our young 20s, we're still young, but if we can advocate and speak out about things, then hopefully people who are, 10, 15, however old, can start to interpret these messages and take them in and be confident when they're 10, rather than waiting until they're our, our age and they're finally successful and they can they brute force their way into confidence. You know, if we can be confident publicly, then maybe like people younger than us can be confident younger when they should have been, when we should have been confident, but we were like, uh, we suck, everyone hates us. Yeah. Get yeah. them while they're young instead of when they're at the esports boomer kind of age. Like exactly. exactly, exactly. Yeah. Maybe we can like help the industry. I mean, we already are, but help the industry boom in the future because of like what we're doing now in uh, not even just esports and swimming and in everything. But well, it's it's not even necessarily making it boom by trying to attract a wider audience. It's just God to no. me, it's like it's just trying to make things better. Yeah, speaking I think of the right people. Knowing that esports and my story through esports, I've found so much happiness and enjoyment and opportunity through it. Yeah. But I also struggled a lot, especially in the early days, with so much hate and so much abuse. Yeah. And it's why so much of what I'm trying to do with my brand and my profile, to the point of being extremely annoying to a lot of other players <laughs> yeah. that I know, yeah. is to have just this incredible positive mental attitude to the point where other people will think I'm being toxic or sarcastic with how yeah. positive that I'm being You're online. Like, no, this but it's is trying real. to be actively trying to be a good role model because yeah. I want to create a better industry mm -hmm. and a better competitive scene and a better environment for young people that are coming through where yeah. they don't have to be afraid of disclosing that they have a disability yeah. from fear of hatred and abuse mm -hmm. or if they are female they can be comfortable with using their microphone without yeah. having to be called like a dumb bitch or what yeah. have you like. that's yeah i mean i love that you're saying that i i feel like a lot of what i'm trying to do with grief and with even just my existence is like like i i i can't even tell you the shit i've had to deal with since being in esports since i was 16 the jobs i've had to work the shitty men i've had to work for whatever this isn't like a men suck parade not at all but um my hope is like i got through it 
surely now I can protect younger women from having to go through it too. You know, it sucked that I had to go through it, but like, you know, I got through, I'm okay. I've had lots of therapy. I'm actually doing quite well, but yeah. like, I hope, <laughs> I hope that my existence, my platform can make sure that it won't keep happening to, you know, younger women, to other people. They don't have to put up with the shit I've had to put up with for them to have a successful existence in esports. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's something that no matter who you are, what you're doing, etc., there's always going to be a lot of nasty people mm. that are out there. Yeah, That's always. across all industries, all environments. Yeah. I've met some incredibly toxic people in swimming as yeah. well. Yeah. And I think ultimately a big part of it is trying to promote people to be as positive as possible, but it's also, I guess, encouraging that younger generation of women, of mm. people with disabilities, with whatever else, to just not... It sounds bad to say just grow a thicker skin or whatever, yeah. but in some ways it's understanding that often the negative voices are the ones that are the loudest. And I have met so many incredible people and yeah. I've made so many great friends through esports. But even now, being a successful sportsman with a you know niche internet micro celebrity <laughs> <Yeah>. status or <laughs> what have you, yeah. often I still find myself getting caught back in the negatives, yeah. the one or two bad voices the, the, the trolls on twitter that keep yeah. floating around and uh. putting crap up there it's like it can be so easy to obsess on the negative and then forget mm. about the positive stuff i think it's 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 not about growing a thicker skin but it's about understanding which voices to listen to which ones are going to add to you you know obviously you can't just switch off if you have some fuckhead you know spamming you and saying horrible things obviously you're reading that and digesting that and interpreting that however you want to but it's yeah it's about learning like okay that sucks and that made me feel bad but i'm not going to let that um decide how i feel about myself i'm going to listen to the people who actually care about me and again it's not you know thicker skin it's being able to decide which you actually go yeah that's valid criticism and i'm gonna change the way i feel about myself according to well, I think what they said. part of it is also not necessarily encouraging the young female community or disability community or whatever to not let that stuff affect them. It's also about encouraging other people to stand up Absolutely. when that abuse is there. Yeah. I, I think time and again, it's something that's kind of broken my heart, even in mm. recent times when I've been in Valorant games and I've had female players on my team yeah. and I have given the other players on my team an opportunity to step up when abuse has occurred mm. and say something about the situation and they haven't stood up yeah and even if it's only like a good couple seconds that i wait before i say something giving it's them the opportunity like, come on to just say something please <laughs> yeah. you know say hey mate calling this person a bitch or whatever is just not okay yeah it's sexist it's wrong mm. it's degrading and derogatory and yeah like, it's not okay. We're just yeah. trying to play this game and do our best and have yeah. fun. And it breaks my heart that, in some, ways, in some ways it breaks my heart, that I'm the person that has to step mm. up and say something. But the more that I keep doing that, and then the thing which I do like is when I say that this isn't on, the other people will kind of backpack off me and say, hey, yeah, mate, what yeah. are you doing? Pull your head in. Yeah. And you although, I, <laughs> although I have to be the one to instigate yeah. it, it's nice. I'm still say. okay with that as long as yeah. the other people come along with me and say, hey, yeah, mate, pull your head in. And then down the track, more people will have the, the courage yeah. almost to just speak up and say, hey, this isn't on. And that's the thing. I think being that person to speak up, you know, you put yourself in the firing line and some people validly aren't prepared to do that. It's like, I'm just trying to game. Why do I have to be the person who sticks up for this other person? Which is valid, but, you know, People should be, and you don't have to take it on personally. You know, there's so many ways to deal with trolls. It doesn't always have to be like a lecture. Like one of my biggest ways is I just laugh at them. Like I'm just like, or I pretend I don't understand what they're saying, so they have to explain it to me. I'm like, I don't, I don't get it. They're like, ah, oh, you dumb bitch, whatever. And I'm like, I don't, I don't get it. Like you play dumb, and they trip over themselves having to like explain why calling you like a stupid bitch is funny, and then. It just becomes like it's embarrassing for them, yeah. and I think that's you know it doesn't have to be like, hey mate, you know blah 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 because they I think then you know trolls are always going to be like, oh fucking whatever they just throw it back at you again. But if you can like, not that you need to conform to this troll behavior, but if you just kind of like stay above it and stay on that level of like yeah man it's all jokes 
but you kind of be like, but the joke you're making is dog shit. They're kind of like, they have nowhere to go from yeah, that. Yeah. There's nothing they can pick on and grab on and call you a wet blanket or call you, or oh, you're probably just a fat, ugly bitch. Like, if I'm like, yeah, but I'm, I'm having as much fun as you are. Yeah, exactly. But your joke's just shit. My joke's just a bit better. Yeah. That's, I don't know. For just me, that's always been my, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's what's worked best for me. And honestly, in many moments, it's turned, they start to like me, which is not something that I endeavor for. But sometimes it's nice to have the trolls on your side because then when you say, shut the fuck up, they're like, yes, Lauren. Yeah. Yes. You, like, you've earned my respect, so yeah, be quiet yeah. now. And yeah. I'm like, it sucks that I should have had to even do that in the first place, but at least it now protects me from them yeah, being from fucked with Future all the time. harm, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <clears throat> Final question. We're a little tipsy, a little bit tipsy. I want to know your full opinion on how rampant the use of the word retard is in gaming. So, to me, language is something that is evolving mm -hmm. over time. And I think that a lot of people, as they're growing up, they're going through school and everything, and you know, they, they may say some really bad words and they'll get punished by teachers or they won't get punished by teachers for saying this kind of stuff. And in esports, it's an environment where it can be really difficult to be punished for these kinds of things because it comes down to whether or not someone else thinks what you said was bad enough to be mm -hmm. reported. Yeah. And I feel like the word retard and calling someone retarded is typically used when someone makes a mistake. Mm. Someone does something that they believe is wrong or what have you. And it's something which is ex it's extremely ableist language because it is comparing a person that has an intellectual disability, that has an inability to function in with mental capacity to the same standard as an able-bodied person, it is saying that that is bad because it's always used in a negative context. Mm. That's the thing, it's the reason why I'm so incredibly against people that use that word in particular because it's saying that this disability is a bad thing. It's saying mm. having a disability is a bad thing because if you have a disability, then you're going to make mistakes. Yeah. And you're going to do the wrong thing, regardless of intellectual or otherwise. That's why I'm also incredibly against people calling each other spastics. Yeah, spastics okay. is very much the same. Mm. My disability, by definition, is cerebral palsy, but the style of di like the diagnosis, it's spastic diplegia, which refers to the oh. kind of, the, the way that it impacts my muscles and the muscles that it kind of affects. It's mostly my legs, and it means I have like high or low spasticity. So the, so oh, flexibility so the word spastic comes from an actual Spastic comes medical... from physical disability. Right. So it used to be, a term where people with like cerebral palsy in that kind of way were referred to as spastics. Right. It was a medical I term know. that yeah. has then been changed into a derogatory term, mm. much like retardation mm. was and a medical term that had been changed into a derogatory term. Stupid and dumb years ago, right? It used to be yeah, exactly. similar and then it turned into a derogatory term and, so they had to phase it out. I think mm. going back to the use of retarded, mm. I don't think that people that use that word are outright meaning to be hateful mm. or abusive or whatever towards people with disability. I think it's just a natural part of language. Mm. Over time, I have had to learn myself to stop using language, like trying to stop calling people idiots. Yeah. Trying to stop using that kind of language because it is, it's derogatory towards people with intellectual impairments. Yeah. It's, it's okay to say someone made a mistake and have a little giggle about it or mm. whatever, but when you're referring it back to saying this person has done something bad and then referring that to saying it's like they have a disability, yeah, that's where the issue comes in. Yeah, And it's something which is, I'm totally, in a way I'm okay with people using the language because I want to educate people about saying yeah. this is why it's bad. Mm. Because if, like, if I'm not there when someone calls someone else a retard, then there's a good chance the other people that are there hearing it aren't going to speak up and say something against it, which means mm. they'll say it again and again and again. Whereas if I am there when someone says that, I can try and pull someone up and say, hey, you know, this isn't okay because of this or that or the other. The thing that breaks my heart though is when I am, let's say I'm streaming on Twitch. I may not even be streaming on Twitch. I'm just playing a game of Valorant and someone uses that word. And I say to them, hey, can you please not use that word? It's really offensive. And they will say, oh, are you streaming? As yeah, if it's, it's like <laughs> the reason that they don't want me to use the language because you might is get because banned. I could get in trouble. <laughs> yeah. Not because it's offensive language. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing that kind of hurts. 
And that's where whenever someone says, oh, are you streaming? That's when I say, does it matter that I'm streaming? Mm. It shouldn't. Yeah. It's just bad language. I always try to be respectful, though, because I don't think it comes from a place of hate. Yeah. It comes from a place of a lack of education and understanding yeah. of the context behind the words. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, if I can... If I can change a few people's perspective on that kind of language and reduce the amount of like ableism that is in the community, whether people realize it or not, then I create a better place and a happier place where maybe more people with intellectual disability will want to play these kinds of games and be a part of things. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, if I can do that, then I'll be really, really happy that I've made a difference. Thank you so much for coming on. You have been such a good guest. You've answered all my questions so good. Thank you so much for tuning into episode eight of Good Grief. I appreciate it so much. This is filmed at Gigi Easy Bar in Melbourne on Queen Street. It is beautiful. The owner Lucky is amazing. Come down here if you're ever in Melbourne. Um, I've never asked this before. I might have said it earlier in the episode because I'm going to film it after this. If you like the content, please maybe give us a like, maybe subscribe. I've never said this before. No, it's kind of awkward. Not even maybe, just like and subscribe. <laughs> Only if you up. like it. Only if you she like it. It's incredible content. <laughs> Thank like, you. Straight up. Thank you. It's really, really good stuff. And I, like, there's a lot more good stuff coming up around the corner. So there please is. like, subscribe, show some yes. support for the scene and for people doing it great things tell Please me cool do. stories yeah hell yeah i'm yeah. just trying to give a spotlight to australian people you know people in esports do good stuff anyway enough of that um thank you so much i'll see you for episode nine check out washed if you haven't and uh thank you so much for coming on follow magnet brand on twitter yes and yeah you'll be advertised